Well, it's a great pleasure to be with you all uh, today. Uh, Mark made me sound like a really great guy. You could have gone on for a few more minutes there. and uh, You missed out my, my greatest claim for fame, the thing I'm most proud of. <clears throat> There's actually a novel with an alcoholic Catholic priest based upon me in it. Uh, some years ago, uh, 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 an author uh, emailed me. She's writing a historical novel on medieval Europe, and uh, she'd listened to some lectures I'd given on the medieval church. And as a thank you for these lectures, wanted to uh, make me a character in her novel. And she suggested making me a peasant farmer, which is what my ancestors would have been. But I didn't want to be a peasant farmer. I've always been a fan of the Graham Greene novel, The Power and the Glory, which I consider, I think it was 25 when he wrote it or something, uh, and I consider one of the great novels of the, the 20th century. So I emailed her back and I said, flattered to be in your book, but any chance you could make me a whiskey priest? So uh, I, there is a, I won't tell you which it is, but there is a historical novel out there with a character called Carl in it, who is an alcoholic priest. Uh, and is based on me, which connects me to one of, my, one of the reasons I'm delighted to be in Austin, and that's I live in Pennsylvania, uh, where uh, the liquor stores are state-controlled, uh, but I happen to love Garrison Brothers bourbon, almost impossible to get hold of in Pennsylvania. So I'm very grateful that uh, the gentleman giving me a ride back from this talk today is going to detour via Total Wine so I can pick up a bottle. But I'm not an alcoholic priest. Uh, I merely resemble one in some ways. <laughs> So <clears throat> I wanted to talk uh, today. Mariana asked me uh, to come and uh, more or less said, talk anything you want, but try to make it practical at the end. Uh, I want to talk about, well, the, the, the burning question of the day, which is not the question I'm going to talk upon, but perhaps the most highly charged political question of, of the day is, what is a woman? It's the name of a Matt Walsh documentary. Uh, it caused something of a storm in a, a recent... Uh, uh, Supreme Court uh, uh, Senate hearing. It's a very pressing question. Uh, careers can be broken by giving the wrong answer to that question. But I become increasingly convinced that as politically charged as that question is, it's less important than a, a less noticed but far more significant question, uh, which really shapes how, would shape how we think about everything. And that is, what is a human? It's not as politically charged a question, but I think it is a significant question. I'm currently working on a, a paper for the Heritage Foundation on transgenderism. And as I've been reading up uh, to write this paper, it, I suddenly realized I'd missed something big in my book, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. For those of you who have not read it, and there's no reason why you should have done, uh, it was an attempt to reflect upon how the statement, I'm a woman trapped in a man's body, has become so plausible. It was not uh, a, a question of judging uh, that question so much as, why has that answer become so plausible? Uh, and it seems to me that uh, while I was on to something in connecting transgenderism to uh, the sexual revolution, uh, and one cannot separate it from the sexual revolution, transhumanism also uh, transgenderism also connects to transhumanism. Uh, another movement that is beginning to grip the popular imagination. And that, of course, points us towards the fact that the question, what is a woman, really comes, uh, comes down to what does it mean to be a human? And how we understand what it means to be human, I think, does shape precisely those things that uh, Mariana wants me to touch upon today. Uh, questions, ultimately, of family and workplace. So what I want to do is spend much of today's talk uh, focusing on, on the question, what is a human? And then throw out some ideas at the end as to how that might shape how we think about family and how we think about a workplace. The question, what is a human, of course, is complicated <clears throat> by the fact that for most of us, uh, what we are and who we are are closely connected. Or we might say uh, what we are tends to take a back seat to who we are. Uh, we are not simply our genes, nor are we simply our set of instincts. Uh, when I teach the kids at Grove in, in the final year humanities course, uh, I, I talk about beavers. Beavers uh, build dams. Human beings build dams too, but we do it in a different way. A beaver is hardwired to build a dam. Human beings choose to build dams or not build dams, 
and they choose to put those dams to a variety of purposes, for example, to reclaim land or to generate electricity, etc., etc. Uh, that's simply, uh, uh, putting it that way, simply a way of pointing to the fact that human beings are creatures of what I would call intention and not merely instinct. We do have some instincts, but we are above all creatures of intention. As I was leaving the house yesterday to, to head to the airport at 8 o'clock in the morning, I live in, in the wilds of western Pennsylvania. It's hard to imagine a place more antithetical to, to the urban environment of Austin on the face of the planet. I live in the middle of nowhere, and as I was driving out of my drive, uh, the local fox that I've come to know and love, we've never spoken, I've never got close to him, but I often see him, uh, trotted across my lawn. Uh, clearly, I always look at the fox and think, he knows he's top of the food chain. He has, no, he has no worries about being out in daylight in our neighborhood. But I was thinking, well, foxes kill birds. I'm probably the only unarmed man uh, within a 50-mile radius in western Pennsylvania. More guns in western Pennsylvania, I think, uh, than in western Europe, quite probably. It's a big hunting area. Human beings kill birds, too. A lot of birds around where I live. But they do it intentionally. They don't do it instinctively. And then you get weird people like me who don't kill birds and don't own guns. We choose. And so much of what we are and who we are and how much we imagine ourselves to be comes down to choices that are not hardwired into us as instincts, but are choices that we certainly experience intuitively as being free and yet defining us. And that's why I think the question of what it means to be a human has become so pressing for us today and in many ways so problematic. And what I want to do in the first real section of this lecture is try to draw out the nature of how we imagine ourselves to be human today by drawing a contrast with how we might have done it five, six, seven hundred years ago. I come from the West Country of uh, England. You may have noticed uh, from my accent that I'm not from Camden, New Jersey. I grew up in the West Country of England, very rural part of the country, a very local part of the country, uh, in that people didn't travel very far from home. Last time I was home, uh, not last time I was home, but four years ago, I was home with my wife and we were in the local pub having lunch and the couple at the table next were chatting to the barman and the barman said, are you from around here? And they said, oh, no, we, we're from Chalford. And my wife said, where's Chalford? And I said, it's about two miles that way. Uh, very local. Well, in some ways, that's a, it's almost like a folk, a cultural folk memory of what it would be like to be brought up in the Middle Ages. I want to spend a few moments now reflecting on if we'd wondered about what it would be like to be a human being in the Middle Ages. What would have been the factors that would have come into play at that point? Well, the first, and uh, it connects to the anecdote I've just given, is we'd be tied to a geographical place. Uh, by the way, my favorite uh, local, all news is local story comes from my wife and I, in, in later in our lives, when I was teaching at the University of Aberdeen, lived in rural Scotland in a village where Donald Trump, after he'd left, bought a golf course. Uh, when he was elected President of the United States in 2016, the local newspaper, with a circulation of probably about 500, ran the headline, Local Businessman Becomes Leader of the Free World, which I thought was uh, something of a classic. Uh, but it, if, if you'd grown up in the Middle Ages, life would have been very local, probably. If you'd been born, say, around about 1350, best guess, you would never have traveled more than 40 miles from where you were born. You would have been baptized, married, and buried in the same church, the same churchyard. You'd have gone to worship as and when you went to worship past the graves of your ancestors. To be you would have been tied to have been tied to a very, very distinctive geographical place. Uh, secondly, you'd have been tied to a very particular family. Uh, my wife comes from the island of Lewis. Uh, anybody know where the island of Lewis is? Where is it, sir? It's off the northwest coast of Scotland. She's there now uh, visiting her mum. Uh, it's two and a half hours off the northwest coast of Scotland. It's heading out into the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, my father-in-law's 
first language was not English, it was Gaelic. The sum total of the uh, inhabitants of all of the Western Isles, I think probably about 40,000. One thing I learned very early on when I was dating my wife and then we got married was when I'm on the island, I never insult or criticize anybody because they're all part of some giant family network that connects somewhere. And no outsider has the right to insult any member of the family. Secondly, I got used to the question when I would visit the Isle of Lewis, when I'd meet people, they'd say, who are your people? In other words, which family are you connected to so that we can locate you? within the kind of framework and the structure of the island. That's a throwback in some ways to early modern and pre-modern society. Had you grown up in the Middle Ages, you would have grown up in a particular family and it would have been a strong source of your identity. It would have defined to a large extent who you were. You would have been set in a position within a hierarchy. Uh, we think a lot today about social mobility. I'm very privileged, and by the way, I think privilege is a good word. I think privilege is something to be grateful for, not to necessarily feel guilty about. I'm very privileged to teach at a college where I would say most of our students come from, I, and again, this, you, you can see I'm English, not American. I think in class, not race categories. Most of the kids that I teach come from lower middle class or working class families where they have been taught that working hard in education is the way to move up. It's the secret to social mobility. They live in a world, and America, of course, epitomized this perhaps more than anything else. They live in a world of social mobility. That would not be the way in the Middle Ages. You would be tied to a particular place and to a particular point in the social hierarchy. Uh, my wife is away at the moment, and she thinks that I spend my evenings reading and writing. Uh, I actually spend my evenings watching classic samurai movies that I know she would never sit through with me. What's fascinating watching classic samurai movies is the social hierarchy that plays out. A classic, social, uh, classic samurai movie like The Seven Samurai, not a cheap martial arts flick, but a classic Japanese movie, has very clearly stratified class divisions with clear expectations of the different classes, but no sense that one could move from one class to another. If you've ever seen the seven samurai, the youngest samurai falls in love with one of the girls in the village. And this can never be, because you cannot have that kind of compromise of the class hierarchy in medieval Japan. So you'd have been located in a particular uh, hierarchy. Uh, it's funny telling the students at Grove this, they, they're all saying, this would be terrible. This would be terrible. And I would say to them, no, because it's only frustrating if you can really imagine a real possibility of it being different. And uh, do you own a cell phone? Yes. Can I borrow it for 12 months? Why not? Yeah, and how are you going to feel if I take your cell phone from you? You're going to feel empty. That's an interesting, I'm going, to, I'm going to use you as an illustration, an electric sort. I'd feel empty. You'd feel frustrated because something that you desire, something that you use, something that in some ways has become part of you, like it's become part of me, has been taken away from you and you've been reduced by that. Would it surprise you that if in 1985 one of my college professors had said to me, I'm going to take your cell phone from you, it wouldn't have bothered me in the slightest wouldn't have bothered me a slightest because they didn't exist and that desire did not exist, that possibility did not exist then. So one of the things I say to the students is this living as part of a hierarchy would have been part of what it meant to be a human person at that particular moment in time. Next point, and I'm going to come back to this uh, when I think about what it's like to be a person in, in modernity, you'd probably been identified by what you made. And this is where family, calling, and identity tie in together because so many surnames, certainly in Britain, track back to trades, things that were being made. Margaret Thatcher. One thing I know is that somewhere way back in her ancestry, the family did thatched roofs. If your name is Wheelwright, if your name is Smith, if your name is Baker, 
Think about that. Identity is being accorded to that which individuals make. And that's going to be important when I bring this round at the end to make some sort of practical reflections. Human beings were what they made. I'm actually very indebted to, uh, to Karl Marx for, the, for that sort of stuff. Marx was really big on that. Human beings being what they made and therefore industrialization became a problem because it alienated people from themselves, from the, which, that which they were making. They no longer became those who made things, they became people who earned money. And I think that is an important and significant shift. The world changed little as well. My guess, if you went back to my home village uh, in Gloucestershire in the year 1100, uh, hung around for a few weeks and then teleported yourself to the same village in 1200, the faces would have changed, but the names, the family names would not have done, and the rhythm and practice of life would not have changed particularly either. Uh, I moved to the United States in 2001, three weeks before 9-11 fascinating experience to be a foreigner with no really legitimate papers in a nation that feels itself under attack by foreigners. Had I had an Arabic look and an Arabic surname, my experience would have been more uncomfortable, I'm sure, but it was pretty uncomfortable uh, as, as it was. But I would say America has changed more in 2001 to 2022 than it probably did in the previous 20 years. And certainly more than Gloucestershire, my home county, would have changed between 1100 and, say, 1300 or 1350 or even 1400. Change was very, very slow. And I think that's con connected to technology. How does technology play into this? Many, many ways. But I would say in the medieval world, technology, by and large, ran along the line set by nature. Yes. My peasant farmer ancestors, and I'm pretty sure they were peasant farmers, plowed the fields with plows. They changed the landscape somewhat. But it was done in a way that was really far more respectful, had to be respectful, of nature than would be the case today. Heidegger, in his great uh, little essay, uh, The Question Concerning uh, Technology, makes the point that there is a difference between building a bridge over a river, which sort of acknowledges the power of nature, and damming a river up to generate electricity. He's saying there are two different ways of using technology there. One which we might say sort of respects nature. The, the other one seeks to subdue nature and make it fit for another purpose entirely. And that brings me to my last point on the medieval person. Nature. Nature had an authority. The rhythm of the seasons would have been critical to my ancestors. Uh, the year had a rhythm to it. Time, we might say, had a rhythm and a structure that was important. My ancestors could not sow their crops in the fall and expect to harvest those crops in the winter. They had to sow their crops in the spring wait throughout the summer, then harvest them in the fall in order to batten down the hatches for the winter that would come in. The seasons had an authority. It always strikes me, and I am a Protestant, but it always strikes me as fascinating that the Zurich Reformation, I'm giving a lecture on this uh, in Grove on Saturday, the Zurich Reformation, uh, which is the Reformed wing of the Reformation as opposed to the Lutheran wing, uh, begins not with the nailing of 95 theses on a church door in Wittenberg, a medieval university monk professor uh, calling for a medieval debate on a medieval practice, i.e. indulgences. It begins with the printer breaking the Lenten fast by cooking sausages. Uh, students always laugh when they think, so the Reformation began with the cooking of sausages. They say, yes, but look at the significance. Time is being transformed there. The old rhythm of the year no longer fits the rising technologies in the new economy. Time is changing. The workday is changing to something that can be much more regular. Time is losing its annual rhythm and becoming more of a weekly thing. You can't talk about that today, but I would say with the speed of technology today, even the weekly rhythm is disappearing. 
My son worked as a consultant for Deloitte's for some years and he had to give it up. The 70, 80 hour work weeks were killing him. I always get annoyed when my academic colleagues complain about their working conditions. I'm thinking, man, you should talk to my sons about some of the working conditions they've had. Uh, but my son gave up because guess what? He not only had to put in a long day, eight to eight in the office, he had to be on call at 3 a.m. in the morning in case his Japanese clients needed to consult with him about their investments. Time has been completely transformed for us. So if we go back to the mid Middle Ages then, how does this all this tie in with identity? I would say identity in the Middle Ages is very easy. Identity comes from place, family, calling, time, rhythm of time, rhythm of the seasons. And all of these things are things over which you have no power whatsoever. They're given to you. And your task is to fit in with them. You are dependent upon external authorities, and external authorities have a powerful, powerful grip over your imagination. The way you think about yourself, and of course, there, but the way you think about what it means to be a human being. Brings me then to the modern age. Okay, let's think about the modern age. First of all, I think one of the things that characterizes the modern age more than anything else is choice. And America, I think, is the land of choice more than anything else. I remember when we moved here in 2001, going to the supermarket, and you know, Britain, fifth, sixth biggest economy in the world, it's a pretty consumerist economy. But I remember going into the average American supermarket and not being able to believe the choice of stuff that you had. And I taught students from sub-Saharan Africa. I have no idea how they handled the choice that one gets, even of painkillers that you can buy over the counter in North America. Well, that's a trivial example of choice, but think about how choice affects those other things I've talked about. Choice of place. We now choose where we live. To talk to a medieval about who are you, you would almost certainly have got an answer that located them somewhere in space. We have a little folk memory of this in Gloucestershire. It's a small county and there's a river runs right through the middle of it. I come from the east side of the river. We don't like the folk who come from the west side of the river. They live about 10 miles away, but we don't like them. They're a bit too close to Wales. You know, they have that sort of fifth columnist feel about them. I have a very local mind, very local mind. My identity on that level sort of tied in with geography. I live three and a half thousand miles away from where I grew up. Uh, my identity in terms of space, there's a kind of nostalgic quality there. Yeah, I'm, I'm English. I come from Gloucestershire. But functionally, it plays no role. In fact, it plays so little role that when Americans refer to me as British, I sort of accept it. Uh, whereas if you come from Britain, you know, that's just a construct to help foreigners understand the United Kingdom. My wife is Scottish. Uh, you refer to as British, she'll correct you and say, no, I'm, I'm Scottish. Uh, Britain is a, is a construct. I'm Scottish. Uh, she would tell people here, we're a mixed race marriage. My husband's English and I'm Scottish. She said, I was vowed I would never marry an Englishman and look how far I've fallen. Uh, <laughs> I, I take the view, you know, we protected these people for centuries. As soon as they're capable of governing themselves, we'll withdraw. It's that kind of thing. But uh, anyway, think of, uh, that's the kind of joke that'll get you fired in some context, I'm sure. But I don't work here, so I'm going to go home at the end of the day. Uh, we have a choice of place. We choose where we live now. I bet in this room, looking around this room, there are a number of ethnicities here. I mean. America, unless you're a Native American, everybody is an immigrant somewhere in the background. And I'm guessing in this room, there are some of you are probably immigrants yourself. If not, you're second, third generation immigrants. Uh, place no longer grips the imagination in terms of identity. Uh, family and rank have been dramatically attenuated. Not only legally, I think, the, the, the rise of no-fault divorce. I, my view is the rise of no-fault divorce was the moment marriage was redefined in America. I won't say gay marriage is a sideshow, but I would say gay marriage is not as culturally significant 
as no-fault divorce by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and, you know, given that the church pretty much didn't bother about no-fault divorce, or at least the Protestant church by and large didn't, it puts you in a very tricky situation for objecting to other forms of marriage that have emerged since. Uh, family has been dramatically attenuated also by, I think, the attenuation of space. Uh, my son, my oldest son, got married uh, uh, 18 months ago, and it was during the time of COVID, so nobody from my wife's or my family's came over to the wedding. And I remember thinking, wow, it really is just us, isn't it? Just me, my wife, and our two sons. And that's it. That's us over here. No wonder, I don't know, no wonder we're a tight-knit family. The number of people I can truly depend upon in life are three, effectively, and two of them are my sons. You know, that's, it's kind of like that a bit at times. You know, when, when your son phones and asks to speak to his mum first, you know there's going to be an ask for money involved somewhere down the line because mum's the soft touch and they're going to get to you through her. Anyway, family, rank. I'm the first person in my family who got to, went to college. My father left school at 16. My grandfather left school at, I think, 13. Uh, my family epitomizes the possibility for social mobility, if you like, within modern culture. Would not have happened if I'd been born six, 700 years ago. I would have been a peasant farmer. I would never have risen to the ranks of being a knight in shining armor. It would not have happened. So my rank gives me no immediate source of identity. Job fluidity. I work now, I think, at five different institutions in roughly the same line of work, but in five different places. Many of my friends have changed jobs. My son was a, a, an economic consultant. Now he's a data analyst, and he's not even out of his 20s yet. Job fluidity. Calling no longer gives us stability. Making has been replaced by consuming, I think, in the modern world. In the past, what would have given you status was the job you did because of the stuff you made, perhaps, or the function you fulfilled. Now, of course, what gives us status is money and our ability to consume. It's one of the, it's, it's odd sometimes, I say to the students and they can't really get their heads around it. I say, you know, Britain is a very class-based society. I say, you know, Paul McCartney may be one of the most highly paid men in Britain, but he'll only ever be working class. And American kids can't get their heads around that because to them, money is class. They say, no, class in Britain is where you grew up, where you went to school. I went to a state school. It was a grammar school, but it was a state-run school. I went to the University of Cambridge, but I know there are certain jobs and there are certain clubs to which I can never belong because I didn't go to the right elite high school. Class is different, but in America, it's not so much that money. And what you consume comes to define you. And then I think there's the technological imagination. What's the technological imagination do? Technology, I think, exacerbates all of these things. Uh, one of the points I'm working towards is saying, you know, we now instinctively think of ourselves as free and autonomous. Uh, one of the things that strikes me that does that is something we perhaps don't think about because it's so trivial. Music. Think about music. 200 years ago, if you wanted to listen to music or you wanted music to be part of your life, you had to either produce it or be in the presence of somebody else who was producing it. Music was something that was produced. Now, music is something that is consumed, and by and large, consumed privately and individually. I got up early this morning. I am saying this as a virtue uh, signal. and went to the gym, and I listened to music because running on a treadmill is utterly boring. Uh, you know, just pounding out the miles, it's a killer. You've got to have something to alleviate the boredom and, and blind you to the pain. So I listened to music, and I listened to it privately. That's an experience nobody could have had 150 years ago. Not only that, but I pick and choose what I listen to. Even when I was growing up and you had albums, vinyl LPs, it was more of an effort to eclectically listen to music then than it is now. Now I have Spotify. I can just pull the different tracks that I like to run through and put them together as my own mix. Uh, 
tragically, just as an aside, it, 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 sort of the death of the concept album is, is painful to me. That there'll never be another Pink Floyd is, is a cause of some mourning, I think, and should be in, in Western society. But think about music. What does that do? Privately consumed music, something that used to bind the community together, has become an item of individual consumption. It shapes the way we think about ourselves and our place in the world. Technology gives us an illusion of power. We tend to think that technology allows us to control things. It gives us an illusion of power, though, at the price, I think, of greater impotence than we've ever had before. And I'm not simply thinking of weapons of mass destruction here. I, uh, one of my life's ambitions was to, to own a convertible sports car. Finally, a few years ago, I bought my wife a new car. In a moment of weakness, she said I could buy a convertible sports car. One of my sons was in the industry at the time. I pulled over into lay-by. I called him straight away, and I said, fix it now before mum changes her mind. We've probably got half an hour here to start the paperwork rolling. So I drive around in a little um, a Mazda Miata soft top. Love it, around those lanes of Pennsylvania. My dream car, though, would be a 1965 Shelby Cobra. At 750 grand, my wife won't let me sell the house and take out a loan to buy one. But what a beautiful car. Uh, it also, they have to be stick shifts. I, I can't stand it. I love Elon Musk for oddly. I don't know why. But he's killing the stick shift. And that's a terrible thing as far as I'm concerned. It has to be a stick shift. But one of the great things about a Shelby Cobra is it's just a stick. There's almost nothing that can go wrong with a Shelby Cobra. My Mazda, it even has this obnoxious system that tells me uh, when to change my gears. Uh, I find that horrible. That, that's an art, not a science, changing gear. But in my Mazda, if something goes wrong, the whole car stops functioning. Technology comes at the price of actually making me more impotent in many ways. It also shapes my mind towards thinking of the world as stuff, or perhaps even more so. There's a problem. I'm going to talk about this more tonight in, in the lecture. But I think technology reshapes the way we imagine the world so that nature itself becomes far more of a problem than it ever was. Yes, cancer has always been a problem. The sexed gender of your body has not always been a problem. Technology has allowed us to imagine that it is so. So it feeds this idea of power. The result of all this, I think, various things, but I would say one of the things is this. We have come to think of ourselves as free and autonomous and as able to define our own identities. Now, that, I think, in Europe is seen as a bleak thing. Sartre's famous statement, man is condemned to be free, which is how I start my humanities lectures at Grove. I like that statement because it's so counterintuitive to the mentality of my students. Growing up as Americans, they think freedom is an unmitigatedly good thing. Sartre, of course, is pointing out that freedom can actually be a burden. And in many ways, I think in the modern world, freedom is a burden that we can barely bear. What must it be like to be a three-year-old and say to your parents, uh, am I a boy or a girl? And your parents say to you, well, that's not for us to decide. We have good friends of ours have just had a baby, and they've given the baby a gender-neutral name so the baby can decide for him or herself what the gender is when they get old enough to. And in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, well, I know you're, you're loving parents and you're wanting to care for the child as much as you can in this situation, but do you realize what a burden you're putting on the child? You're asking them to define and decide their identity at the most fundamental level. Is that a burden the individual can truly bear? So freedom and autonomy, I think, creates anxiety. It also, it also tilts us towards thinking of other people, other people as problems or instruments. When we see ourselves as defining ourselves, when we see ourselves as free and autonomous, how do we come to think about other people? And this is where I think it becomes significant for the family and significant for the workplace. It tilts us towards seeing other people as instruments, as means towards an end, as a means towards my self-realization, rather than as ends 
in themselves. And what's the, what's the issue there? How does that play out? Well, I think what it does, or, or what is it based on? I think what it does is it's based upon the notion that human beings, as I say, are fundamentally free and autonomous. And what I want to do now, really, is, is, start, is, is just offer some thoughts and say, but what if that isn't true? How would that reshape how we think about ourselves in the world, how we think about ourselves in relation to our families, and how we think about ourselves in the workplace? Well, the first thing I would say about it is, is this. It's obviously not true. It is obviously not true, even though we all tend to believe it. If the history of humanity teaches us anything, one of the things it teaches us is this. Just because an idea is wrong and patently false does not mean that a lot of people won't believe it and attempt to build their lives and build society on the basis of it. Uh, think of Nazi Germany. For another project I'm working on, I sat through The Triumph of the Will the other night, Leni Riefenstahl's uh, famous uh, film of the 1934 uh, Nuremberg rallies. It is a stunning piece of cinema. Uh, and it is very disturbing, though perhaps not disturbing for the reasons you might think. What most disturbed me about it was, wow, this is like every political pitch I see being made today. The anti-Semitism is disturbing. The aesthetics have been adopted wholesale, I think, uh, by contemporary political culture. But that film gripped the German imagination. It reinforced commitment to an ideology that I would say is patently false, that Jews are not human beings, that Jews are the equivalent of a, a bacillus or a contagion to be wiped out. Patently false. Well, autonomy also is a false, false ideology as well. I was giving a lecture a couple of weeks ago, my, young, my oldest son and his uh, new, she was about three months old at the time, his, uh, his, my granddaughter was there, and I told my son, stand up and, and show the audience uh, uh, Emily, and he stood up and showed it to her. Partly it was me wanting to show off my granddaughter, partly I wanted to make a point. I asked the audience, so is my granddaughter born free? To which the obvious answer was no. If my son abandons her in the woods tonight, she's dead within 36 hours. She's dead within 36 hours. Human beings are not born free. Human beings, I would suggest, contrary to what the modern world is telling us through its mobility, through its collapsing of time, through its technological revolution, through the way it provides us with music, human beings are not autonomous. We are always defined by relationships of dependency and obligation. And we know that by instinct. Intentions of we do know that instinctively. Uh, two, two examples, one a thought experiment and one actually drawn from an interview. Peter Singer, Peter Singer, the, the great uh, ethicist, Princeton ethicist, radical Princeton ethicist, pro-abortion, pro-infanticide, pro-euthanasia, and unabashedly so. I'll give him credit for being consistent and honest. When his mother was ill with Alzheimer's disease, he helped care for her. I found an interview with him online where somebody asked him, uh, the interviewer asked him, wasn't it rather inconsistent for you to care for your mother? And Singer, in an unguarded moment, gave a beautiful answer. It's truly a beautiful answer. He says, yes, I guess it's different when it's your own mother. It's a stunning insight. You bet it's different when you're, it's your own mother because there's a natural tie there that you may not be able to articulate. You may not be able to put it into a test tube and analyze it, but it's nonetheless real. Secondly, imagine a, a scenario. I don't think this has ever happened, but you can imagine uh, Robert George, the famous pro-life professor from Princeton, walking down uh, Witherspoon Street late one night, chatting away with Peter Singer. Perhaps an unlikely scenario, but let's say it takes place. They walk down the street and they hear a baby crying. And they look across, and there, in one of the shop door fronts, there's a baby in a cradle crying. I bet the two of them do not disagree on what is to be done. 
I don't think Robert George is going to say, we need to call the police and get this baby somewhere safe. And Peter Singer is going to say, no, it's not really a human person. It may have life, but it's not a person. It has no concept of the future. We can just let it die. He's not going to do that. Instinctively and intuitively, the two of them are going to want to get that child safe, get them to care. So all this is to say, I think the modern philosophy of autonomy flies in the face of what it actually means to be human. There are natural instincts there. How does that play out in family and workplace? Well, I would suggest a, a number of things. Uh, we need to think about family and workplace in a way that reflects the fact that human beings exist in a network of natural dependencies and obligations. I don't think we can turn back the economic tide and say, well, all women have got to go home now and should be homemakers. I think that that horse has bolted. But I do think it behoves uh, businessmen and business owners to think about how their business might operate in a way that helps and assists those employees who have families to properly fulfill those obligations to those to whom they are obliged, those who are naturally dependent upon them. Maybe it needs a rethinking of, uh, of, of the workplace from seeing it as a place where we uh, are earning money to a place where we're actually helping people to be truly human. Clearly, businesses have to make money. I'm not that naive. I may work, uh, I may produce nothing of any use. Uh, get, but I understand that you've got to produce stuff that you've got to be able to sell. You've got to be able to make money. But if you have a philosophy that sees that as part of a strategy that allows people to be truly human, to take pride in their work, for example, to take pride in the things that they make, the deals that they broker, and allows them to fulfill their commitments and obligations to others. Surely that is a more human kind of thing than others. The family, uh, I think, and uh, we could get into all kinds of discussions here. Uh, it seems to me that we are at a point in our society where there is a dangerous tilting uh, towards seeing children either as problematic or as seeing them as consumer goods or as commodities. Various reasons for that. I might touch upon that this evening, though some of the reasons for that are likely to be very controversial and, and highly contested. But a reimagining of the family that sees the family actually as a network of natural obligations, where the whole idea that one might say, you know, do I have to sacrifice my career for my children or my children for my career? Is it possible to reach a position where that becomes a nonsensical statement? So all of this is to say then, I think what we're witnessing at the moment is a dramatic transformation of what it means to be a human being compared to that which it has been historically. And in a way that I think actually defies, defies some of the instincts that are actually hardwired into us and make us human. I want to end there to give some time for, for questions or discussion.